when they're worshiping and praising our mighty God. Amen. Come on, let's sing all together. Hey. Who is the way, the truth, the life? Hey. Who is the holy word of I? Come on. Who is the vision to our eyes? Who is the love that will abide? Let's go.
call back to our minds and our hearts the hope of God's goodness in Jesus Christ, his death, his resurrection. We're going to read scripture together as we do this. I want everyone in the room, everyone online, let's say this scripture with our mouth. It's a beautiful image given to us in Revelation, Revelation 5. Here we go. It'll be on the screen. Let's all say this together. Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. From every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God. And they shall reign on earth. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever we worship you jesus thank you lord
words a minute ago and they're the words that come right of ex out of Exodus the 33rd chapter they're the words of Moses and when God says to Moses Moses what do you want me to do for you and Moses could have asked for anything of God in that moment and you know what Moses said Moses said God show me your glory that's what he said that's what we just sang 
And here's what happened right after that. God could have blown Moses away with something hugely impressive. He could have blown him away with his own majesty. But God said, I will demonstrate. I will pour out my glory in this. I will pour out my goodness. I will pour out my mercy. And I will pour out my compassion. And today, as we sing, God, show us your glory. He's willing. He wants to pour out his mercy and his compassion and his goodness into your life. And that's worthy of us giving him a shout of praise one more time. He's been good. He's been merciful. He's been compassionate to us through Jesus. And we give you praise, God. And we thank you that you're willing to pour out your glory, not in a way that just makes you look good, but in a way that brings us to life, heals us from the inside, shows us salvation in Jesus. And we thank you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Church on the Move, are you glad you came to church this morning? Man, I'm so glad that you're here. Thanks for worshiping with us. You can go ahead and have a seat. Man, it's good to see you guys. I've been out for a couple of weeks and it's so good to be back. Realize how much I miss my church family when I'm not here. My name's Lee. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, I'm the campus pastor here at our Tulsa location. And and I got something special I wanna ask those of you who are new to do. If you're new around here, maybe it's your first Sunday. Maybe you've only been here a couple of times and you haven't taken us up on this. Hey, take out your phone right now. Send a text message to the number 23101. That's the Church on the Move number, 23101. And just text the word NEW. We want to send you a Starbucks gift card. Why? Because when you come into our home, we, we want to give you a cup of coffee. We want to sit down and get to know you better. This is just a way for us to say thank you for being here. And we hope that you'll come back. Find out more about what's going on in the life and the family of Church on the Move. And some of you, maybe you've been here for a little while, and you're saying, okay, it's a big church. How do I get involved? How do I get to know people? We've got a great first step for you. It's called Next Move. It's a monthly gathering that we do. We feed you free food, and uh, it's myself and Pastor Witt is there. Pastor Witt will share who we are and where we're headed as a church. Our team gets to meet you and get to know you a little bit more. It's a great way to find where you might belong in the family of Church on the Move. So please take us up on that. Here's how to find out more about our Next Move gatherings. Just take that same text uh, number 23101, send it to that number, and text the word NEXT. Text the word NEXT, and you can find out everything you need to know about Next Move. You know, one thing that if you've been around here very long that you discover about our church family, something interesting, and that is that a bunch of us have come to a place where we not only willingly give back to God some of our resources, but we know that there's joy in doing it. That's a little bit counterintuitive. I mean, don't we want to hold on to what we have, save it? But God says, be generous as I have been generous and see if I don't pour out blessing and joy in your life when you trust me with your resources. In fact, my good friend, John Mitchell, who's back here on the drums, the Lord showed his family this principle in a really unique way not long ago. Check this out. My name is John Mitchell. I work full-time at the church in the worship department. And before I did that, I had an audio production studio for 13 years and my wife and I flipped houses on the side. About a year ago, actually, um, had an awesome opportunity to get a house. Started to renovate it. Once we got into the spring, we were almost wrapped up and got a call from a neighbor at that house and said, hey, uh, bad news. Looks like somebody's broken into the house. Everything's actually okay, nothing's destroyed, but all of your tools are gone. And I was just like, Dad, come it. And I think that was really my response to it was, John, you're, you're a dummy. You, sh- you knew you shouldn't leave your tools there. Yeah, I was, I was definitely bummed. I'm like, okay, I need to go <laughs> see what happened. And so I take my son, Frankie. So he's kind of inquisitive. He hasn't really experienced this type of thing before he's asking me some questions. I'm just like, well, buddy, you know, some people, for whatever reason, they decide to to steal and to take from others. And, you know, it's just not God's way. This isn't the way of Jesus. But I began to think about well, what is the way of Jesus? And I was just re- reminded of do good to those who, who treat you wrong. I just kind of had this idea in the moment. I was like, we can pray for this person and we can pray that God would bless them. So we just took a quick moment there in the house and prayed. Fast forward only really about a couple weeks later, a good friend of mine who I used to do a ton of work for 
uh, kind of randomly reached out and was like, hey, I need your help with this project. And it was the type of work I used to do, audio work that I used to do full time. He just said, hey, I've got this much money. It's yours if you can do this. And it was like double or triple, like, the amount of time and, and money that would normally be billed for that. This was basically an overage by about the amount of, that was the cost of the tools to replace. When I saw Frankie next, I was like, Frankie, guess what? He was obviously super excited. I think God wants to invite us into his way of doing things. I think financially it's the exact same thing. There is a a, a trusting of God and an interacting with Him on the basis of what He said to be generous that releases God's blessing in our life. For us, uh, practically, that's um, paying our tithes, or 10% of our income, giving that uh, into the kingdom of God and, and trusting Him that you know the rest of it He's going to bless and, and take care of us. I would just say, as a brother who's following Jesus, take a step and just try it. When we do that, it releases us and we get to live in that state of watching him provide for us because now we're trusting him. Yeah, well, I mean, <clears throat> we can clap for that. You know what I love about John's story is it's my story too. I, I don't flip houses and got all my tools stolen, but I also in my family have learned that when I trust God with what I have, that he not only blesses me in that process, but he uses me to be a blessing to others. That's what this church has been doing for 34 years. A lot of us have learned that principle. We're living by it. We've, we've felt the joy of giving, but maybe some of you haven't taken that step yet. You haven't yet trusted God in that area of your life. We invite you to do that with us. We do it every week. It's a part of how we worship. We got a couple of different ways that we give around here. You can take your phone out, that same number 23101 and text the word give and you'll get instructions there on how to give digitally if you'd like to give that way. Or if you came prepared to give in the room with check or cash, we've got drop boxes at all of our exits. You can just drop your giving there uh, at the end of the service. Would you bow your heads with me and let's pray over this time. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your generosity. We thank you that you went first when it comes to giving. And now we, we recognize we're just stewards of the things that you've given us. And so we give generously as well. I thank you for all the people and the families in this church that give so generously so that we're not only blessed by it, but that the city of Tulsa and around the world can be blessed by you through us. What a privilege. Thank you, God, for those who give. And thank you, God, for the gifts that we might use them with wisdom to advance your kingdom. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I have been loving this To Be Continued series as we look at the first century church in the book of Acts and see that God was, was eager to work in them and through them. And now in the 21st century church, God still is eager to work in us and through us. And I get the privilege of introducing our special guest speaker today, Marty Sloan. Marty Sloan has been a dear friend of Church on the Move for years. He used to be the, the senior pastor at Harvest Time Church over in Fort Smith, Arkansas. And then at the beginning of 2020, Marty, what a time to take on a new church at the beginning of 2020. He moved his family up to Naperville, Illinois, the Chicagoland area, and took over Calvary Church up there with his wife, Becky, and their two sons. Marty has been a dear friend of Church on the Move for a long time, and we were looking at Acts, the fourth and fifth chapter. We were like, let's bring Marty in, because Marty's got an amazing message from the book of Acts that I want you to hear. So now, Church on the Move, let's give a big family welcome to our good friend, Marty Sloan. Hey, what's going on, Church on the Move? Are you glad to be in God's house? Come on, give God a big praise this morning. It is so good to see you guys. Man, Lee's got tons of energy. He's like a walking human Red Bull. Can I get somebody to affirm that? He's, he's just full of juice today. I love that. We've been in a great series, and I'm, I'm excited to be part of it today. I want to just, first of all, thank Pastor Witt. How many thank God for your pastor, Pastor Witt and Heather? They do a great job. Thank him for the friendship and... Uh, the relationship uh, that I've had with COTM for almost 15 years now, uh, this church has been guiding uh, my life, influencing me as a pastor, and so I want to say thank you, uh, because you guys are a great congregation, and uh, you guys have definitely shaped my journey as a lead pastor, so thank you for making an impact in my life. I thank God for your pastor, great friend, and we have lots of talks uh, throughout the week on text, and exchange conversations, so I thank God for that today. But we're in the book of Acts. I've been watching this series with you guys online, 
So I've been enjoying this uh, from where I've been living at. And it's so cool to watch the early church form. As I watch this, I just kind of wonder what it might have been like. And so today as we go through the conversation of Scripture, I want to encourage you not just to hear the story, but to put yourself in the conversation. I, I know we can do this at some level, maybe limited certainly, but if we could just today, maybe for a second or two, if we could just see ourselves as part of this first church, what would that have been like? You're just after the resurrection of Christ, you're seeing this movement take over the land. You're seeing these signs and wonders, people coming to know Jesus, coming to this, this new way, this new message, this gospel. You're seeing the disciples gather, you're seeing the uproom outpouring, you're seeing different languages spoken. You're seeing all this stuff place and all take place and here are all these people, this is all brand new to them. They had no Bible, they had no context like we have today, and yet they're seeing this stuff take over their life and begin to change everything. And that's the picture of the early church. You know, the, the main reason the church spread, though, was not because of their marketing campaign or because they had good coffee shops. The church spread. That was a good stop for a joke right there. You guys looked at me. The, the, the church spread because the simplicity of the message that Jesus is the only way. And that was the, the, the strength of their story. That was the strength of their sermon that we begin to, they begin to preach. And so we see this unfold. And so as I look at this, I just want to kind of think about the idea that Jesus was not just the message. He was the example. He laid down his life. He gave everything. He was the initial missionary of the church. He was the one that said, look at my example. He was a sacrificial servant. And because of his approach, he launched the mindset of outreach and growth. And the church began to grow over and over and over again. But as you think about this text today, we're going to look at two different texts. Don't just read the text, put yourself in the text. We're going to read two different texts. First of all is a text at the back of Acts chapter 4, but we'll be in verse 32. And then we're going to bounce to chapter 5, and I bet you've heard this story before. Has anybody here ever heard the story about a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira who lied about what they brought to the apostles and they fell over dead? You guys heard that? So when I read that, we're going to retake the offering today <laughs> and give you a chance to get back in. Acts chapter 4, verse 32, here we go. Get your Bible out. You got your Bible? Say yes. All right, here we go. Verse 32, now the multitude of those who believed, and here's a description, were of one heart, one soul. Neither did anyone say that they had uh, the things he possessed was his own. Think about that. Neither did anyone say that the things he possessed was his own. But they had all things in what? Common. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each one as any one had need. Now think about that right there. In this move of the Spirit of God, in this move of this new message, people are starting to sell their stuff and bring it and say, hey, I want to contribute. Now, let me give some context. This was not in response to a message that the disciples preached. This was not in response to a conference on how to sell your stuff and give it back to the church. This was literally an individual response as to what happened inside of them. Now they're responding on the outside of themselves. Think about that and don't lose sight of that thought today. Keep reading our text. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement. A Levite of the country of Cyprus, having sold some land, he brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. The book of Acts shows us a powerful picture of living a life guided by the Spirit of God. And again, I want to emphasize this. Again, I'll say it three more times or more throughout this sermon today. They were not told to do this. They simply did it. And don't forget that because each one of them were having this sense of stirring within them that something's happened on the inside of me. And because of what's happened on the inside of me, I must respond with something that reflects that transformation. 
Acts teaches each one of us how to live together in meaningful Christian community. It's all about the community. It's not about the individual. It's about the greater sum of all of us. See, the early church was known for confronting the challenges that correct the cultural values and assumptions that we saw then and we see today with a brand new vision for how to live your life. Hear me today. Jesus Christ is the best advocate to fix the social ailments of the world today. He is, absolutely is. Anybody else who tries to tell you that they can solve mankind's conflict without the gospel, without the message of Christ, they're doing it for their purpose, but Jesus is the initial source of human equality, liberation, empowerment, and so much more. Here's why Jesus came to set captives free, to heal the blind eyes, to set those at liberty who were bound. Jesus is the one who gave his life, not for some of the world but for all the world he therefore is the greatest advocate that you are made in the image of God and each one of us should put him at the front of this conversation when I think about this picture we just came across it's interesting that they just begin to do this people begin to go to their homes and look at what they had and say I don't have to have this. I can do without. I'm going to get rid of this because somebody else might have any. Now, I realize already many of you are going, where is this going today? Is he going to start asking for the titles to our cars? Does he want my deed to my house? No, and I'm not even sure that that's the focus of this text. But the one thing, you're glad for that part, aren't you? Phew, it's close. The one thing that is certain in this text is that people felt compelled on their own to respond externally because of what had happened internally. Is it, is it just me or is it easy at times to forget all that God has done for you? Is it easy to just take it all for granted and, and, and before you know it, you're just living life and even sometimes fail to pause and say, God, thank you for all you've done? Is there anybody here today who your life is better off because you met a man named Jesus? Is there anybody here today, come on, is there anybody here that just wants to say, come on, just wants to say, say thank you, God. Come on, let's just thank him today for all he's done. Is there anybody here today that because of Jesus, your life is now going a better direction? Is there anybody here today because of Jesus, you have a better marriage, better kids, better health, better finance, every part of your life is better. Let me just encourage you, don't forget to talk about that to people. I, I use this analogy that it's kind of earthly, but it makes sense for all of us, and I would get this. When I met my wife, and we've been together 27 years married this fall, yeah, yeah, praise God for her. And we dated four years prior to that. So we have this fall coming up 31 years of doing life together. And I just got to tell you, the moment I met her, it changed everything. It changed how I woke up, it changed how I walked, and it changed my everything. So for 31 years, she has radically changed my life, and I've been crazy about her. Now, she not so much about me for the same time frame, because I'm more of a work in progress. <laughs> but the reality is this, because I met her, how much more should I talk about what happened when I met a man named Jesus? And I want to encourage you, church, the move family, those in the house and those lawn, don't ever forget to remember all God's done for you. When you look at this story, it's interesting because we also see throughout the book of Acts the, the powerful component of living the spirit-led life. And we, we often talk about that, and, and I, I, came out of, I came out of very, very um, uh, Pentecostal-type roots in my childhood. And I've been to church, I've seen some stuff. <laughs> Anybody ever seen some stuff in church before? Yeah. I was never in the war, but I went to church. And, and I've seen some stuff. And so in the book of Acts, it's like many people want to hover around this one part of Acts. But the truth is, what you're seeing throughout the book of Acts is you're seeing the power of the Holy Spirit transforming someone's life so much that nothing else matters. 
Can you imagine being in a place in your life in the current culture today in which the Holy Spirit transformed your life so much that nothing else mattered anymore? Think about our current mindset even in our country today, in our world today. It's always about getting more, having more, doing more, being more, being more, more liked, more followers, more this, more that. Can you imagine being in a place when you're so transformed by the Spirit of God that all those things simply fade away and doesn't even fade? factor in the conversation. And that's what you see in the book of Acts. Transform people who were transformed so much that nothing else mattered. Each one of us needs to ask ourselves when we look at this conversation, what is the representation of your response to God? Now we see a guy named Barnabas come along. He was called Barnabas, the son of encouragement, by the disciples because he was obviously one who was encouraging to people. And we see Barnabas throughout the book of Acts. You'll see him again later on in the book of Acts. But here we see that his encouragement was directly connected to his generosity and his response to the Spirit of God moving through them. Each one of us need to ask ourselves the question. Hear me on this today close. What is my response to God? For what God has done for me and around me on the earth. What is your response to God? When you think of all that God has done, is there anybody here again who God has set you free from something in this life? Put your hand up high real fast. Anybody? Anybody here today that because of him you have eternal hope that you know that when you die you're not dead? Now we talk about that and we go, yeah, and we move along. But just think about that. Think about that, and my question back is, what is your response to what's happening? When you think about all God has done for you, what is your reasonable response back to God? This generosity was not an instruction, nor was it a passing whim. But literally, every person who we see being generous in the book of Acts, they're responding to what the Spirit has done. And because of that encounter, now they must do something as well. I think about this verse from Psalm 116. Don't just don't turn. It says, what shall I render the Lord for all his benefits toward me? Psalm 103, praise the Lord my soul and all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord my soul and forget not all his what? Benefits. Is there anybody here today that you've experienced the benefits of the spirit-led life? God leading you, God guiding you. And today you just want to say, God, thank you for blessing me. Thank you, God, for all you've done. Let's just take a second here and let's just thank God today for all he's done for us. Because he has been so good to us. This early church, man, I wish I could have seen it. Or maybe I can Maybe, maybe it's easier to read about it versus being in it. Because if I just read it, I can kind of, well, that's them and this is now. But can you imagine being in such a place with people so transformed by the Spirit of God that everything that we hold to by nature is now irrelevant? Wouldn't that be pretty cool? And I can read about it, and because I'm reading about it now, I can kind of go, well, that was those people. But what if that could happen again today? What if God's Spirit could once again resurrect a church that was so transformed by the Spirit of God that all the things that most people hold to in this life no longer matter, no longer even factor, no longer even consider weight in our journey? What if we could be so impacted today in this house and those online by the Spirit of God that it radically changed everything else? Because that's what you see in the book of Acts. You say, Marty, can that happen again? Absolutely. You know why? Because he's the same spirit today as he was 2,000 years ago. God is the same God today as he was in creation. Jesus is still the same today as he was yesterday and today and forever. It can happen once again. The question is, can it happen in you? And oh, by the way, it's happening somewhere for somebody. There are people today who live a life so led by the Spirit that nothing else matters. 
They've been so transformed by the word of God that everything is different about their journey. And it changes everything. Now, what's so cool about this is we begin to see that this picture of the first church was very purposeful about how they connected to each other. I think it's so cool because the church is always an open invitation experience. Every church I know has a whosoever will approach. Anybody's welcome in this house. They can come. Those I connect with, that's their mantra. But what's interesting is, even though the church is very inclusive, the church is definitely unique in that it relates to each other different with care and concern. How many would agree that Christians ought to relate to each other different within the body of Christ? Would you agree with that? that? That we should treat each other as part of the body, and every person for that matter, but we should act different than those who are outside the body of Christ. That those who don't have this message, they're welcome to join us and they be part of the family, certainly, but they respond differently. So would you agree that believers should relate to people different than non-believers? It's two or six of you. <laughs> well, let's go back to a different text then right now. I'll never forget this years ago, and I've been part of three churches, so I can now tell stories like this. Years ago, I was in a situation where um, I, I rolled through a stop sign. Anybody here ever violated a traffic law in your life? Put your hand up real fast. <laughs> well, the rest of you, the cops aren't watching. You're fine. Put your hand up real fast. <laughs> There's a camera picturing all this, and the TPD will meet you outside today. So... I've been part of three churches, and that's going to come back to be important in just a second. But I rolled through this stop sign. I didn't see it. It's a parking lot area. It wasn't a fast pace. It was maybe going 10 miles an hour. And, and I was coming through where this, where this road section uh, was supposed to stop, which I missed. And this other part was coming through, so I kind of rolled through. So the guy over here, man, he was not a happy camper. And, man, he hit the horn. He hit the horn hard hit it several times with significant passion. He told me I was number one. He told me to look up for good things are coming in my way. He told me to expect a blessing in my life in the future. And I think he referenced something about the end of my life coming soon. And here's the best part of the whole story is the guy went to my church. And can I just tell you how much that made my day? And, and how much when I looked at that, I thought, oh, this is money. This guy, and he, I don't think to this day he knows that was me, and I didn't wait around. What I should have done was got out of the car and went, I'm so sorry. Because he would have turned white. <laughs> Multiple shades of ash white as the blood left his body. I want to take you to a second story. The second story is in Acts chapter 5. I'm going to bring these back together because there's a connection here. I've kind of set some groundwork, but let's go to Acts chapter 5. Remember, don't forget about a man named Barnabas. And Barnabas had this urging in his spirit that something needs to happen. I, I've experienced this grace, this forgiveness of sin, this great power. I've seen this, and therefore I'm going to respond back. Now let's go to Acts chapter 5. And let's pick up a story that you heard before about a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira. Here we go. But a certain man named Ananias and his, with his Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. Again, they're... They're selling things off. And he kept back part of the proceeds. His wife also being aware. Now, now watch every word in this story. His wife also being aware of it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Do you see the contrast already in the two stories? The first story, the guy sold a possession and brought everything the second story we see here with Ananias and Sapphira, that they, they sell a possession also, but they're bringing a part and they're holding back a part. But Ananias, or but Peter said to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back a part of the price of your land for yourself? While it remained, was it not, now watch this, while it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? you got to get this. Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Keep reading verse 5. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon those who heard these things, I would say so. 
And the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, she said, he said, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. Was that the correct amount, he's saying? And she said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Verse 10, then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all those who heard these things. I would say great fear definitely came upon all the church. Now, when you look at these stories, there's an amazing contrast here. Let me give some context from the text. First of all, Barnabas and Ananias and Sapphira were all part of the same movement. They're all experienced in this refreshing of this great grace from the Holy Spirit. They're, they're having this great sense that something must happen. And again, the flow of generosity here was not an instruction by the apostles. It was simply a generosity that was part of their personal response to what they had sensed on the inside. It's clear to me in this text that while the gospel is deeply private, it is lived very public. In fact, our world today wants to invert that. Our world today wants to tell you, keep your faith inside. And the Bible is abundantly clear. This right here is not an inside message. It's an inside transformation that must manifest on the outside. Your faith should be very public, not very private. What you believe, you should shout to the mountaintops Listen, we talk about everything on the planet on our social platforms today. And I promise you this, you better talk more about Jesus than anything else on your social page because he's the only eternal thing you'll ever talk about. And I'm saying that right in the middle of football season to Sooner Country. But you've got to get the picture here. Two different stories both sense the same urgency. Both have the same compelling, yet they give us the clarity that each one of us get to pick and choose how we respond to God. In all honesty, had Ananias and Sapphira not sold anything, they would have still been alive. They didn't have to do what they did. But what they couldn't do was make it sound like they were doing something they weren't doing. Which brings us to the thought for us today. How easy is it for us to lie to ourselves about what we're doing for God? How easy is it for us to think that this Christian life is so challenging, so difficult, and when you get any kind of an instruction to do this or do that, you're thinking to yourself, I can never do that. Life is so difficult. How easy is it for us to think we're giving God our everything when we know we're holding something back all along? And don't look at just the resource. Don't look at just the property or the money. That's not what this is about. I'm not asking you today to bring your deed to your vehicle or your car or your house. I'm not asking that at all. I'm not even saying, let me see your checking account. What I'm saying to you is be certain that you're giving God everything that you think you're giving God and be sure that nothing is held back from you toward God because that's the gap the Holy Spirit dealt with right here. And it's easy for us to present to people that we're doing this or we're doing that, and we're not doing any of it. The apostle said so clearly, guys, this was yours all along. This was in your possession, your power. Why? Even if you just came up and said, listen, this is only half of what we sold it for. But here's what you see in Ananias and Sapphira. They wanted the identity with generosity, but without the sacrifice of generosity. Do you know that when you go to a church or when you say you're a believer or, or people know you go to church, people know you're a believer, that they now have certain perspectives on what that means? And did you know that when you say you go to certain church A or certain church B, that people assume that you're part of that church's vision and or mission, but you may not be anywhere close to that? 
People assume when you go to church like COTM that you're part of the vision of the house. And the truth is you may be walking in every week and walking out and doing nothing. But by association, people believe that you're dialed in and you know in your own heart that you're not quite there. I want to challenge you today. Let's all go one more notch closer to giving God our everything and holding nothing back from God. Or at least simply declare where you really stand with God. It is easy in the Christian life to look a certain part, to talk a certain part, but on the inside be very far from the part you talk. This is an issue of authentic Christian living. And it's unique to me that the Holy Spirit wasn't going to have that in the early church. The Spirit of God simply said that this is going to be a pure church. And we're going to make sure that as this church forms and starts out, that literally people are who we think they are. You see, go back to my opening question, can the Holy Spirit do this again? Well, the Holy Spirit's doing it right now. It's just a matter of all of us coming with the full story open-handed. It's a matter of all of us no longer holding back from God. You say, Marty, what are you talking about? I'm talking about your time, your talent, your testimony, your treasure. So many things are in that conversation. Not just one thing, but everything. And again, don't lose track here with this story of the possession sold. I'm not asking you for that. What I'm simply asking you is simply do this. Be sure that what you say you bring to God is what you're really bringing to God. If you think you're bringing your whole worship on a weekend service, make sure you're bringing your whole worship. If you think you're bringing back your full tithe, make sure it's your full tithe. I don't know what you make. I often get asked this question as a pastor. How many people in your church tithe? My answer is I have no idea. Because I don't know what anybody makes. I know that I tithe because I know what my 10% looks like. But I don't know what yours looks like, but you do. And when you say you are, are you really? When you say, yeah, I can't do this or I can't do that, is it really where your heart is? Because what we see in this text, in this story, is the compelling nature that when the Spirit of God truly transforms your life, you want to be authentic in everything you bring to God. See, their motive here was false motive. It was a, it was a sense of wanting the credit without the real sacrifice. They, 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 they wanted to be counted amongst the generous people but hold back enough from themselves. They were very focused on the outside, not on the inside. Their motive was not to alleviate the pain of the poor, but to elevate themselves in people's eyes. And that's the contrast of these stories in Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5. Let me land the plane today. It's easy for us to want to belong to the body of Christ without becoming like Christ. We can crave identity with Christ while holding on to our own independence all day long. Yet the Bible uses terms like crucified with Christ. I would suggest that when you're crucified, you've just given up your independence. I, I would suggest that when you take up your cross and follow him, that you've given everything up. You've laid everything aside. You've said, I will pay the price for the cause of Christ. And that's the picture of this early church. It's easy for us to want to be looked at as a believer without the life that supports it. My friend Mark Batterson says this in his book, All In. He says, we're too Christian to enjoy sin and too sinful to enjoy Christ. We've got just enough Jesus to be informed, but not enough to be transformed. And what you see in this early church is they were transformed by the power of the message of Christ. And that's my prayer for you today, Church of the Move family. Let's let the Holy Spirit hit us so hard on the inside. Let's transform us so deep on the inside that all the things that matter to everybody else no longer matter to us the same. Let me come back to Barnabas. Barnabas was known as an encourager. You'll see him again, as I said earlier in the book of Acts. He's a great encourager to the body of Christ, to those who are wounded, those who are limping in life. What would happen if we could be a house of encouragement? Not just by our gifts, but by our words, by our presence. Sometimes showing up matters more than you know. I was a young pastor and I was preaching, and there was a, uh, an older pastor. He's a mentor in my life to this day. 
and I was preaching at 21, 22 years of age, guys, and it just wasn't that good. It was probably terrible. I'm not sure how much better it is today, but it was pretty bad then, I know for sure. But he would just simply look at me and say, Marty, I'm for you. I've never forgotten that. It's been 25 years, and I can still see it today. I can hear it today, him simply saying, I'm for you. What if we could turn the culture today in this world from critiquing everybody to encouraging everybody? What if we could stop trying to point out what's wrong with someone and just simply say, how can I help? The other day I was talking to a, to a pastor friend. We were discussing a, a church that we're part of, and we kind of connected to it, and they've been going through a challenge, and I begin to feel myself going into a place of critiquing the situation. I know you've never done that before, like the stop signs. But something dropped in my heart and said, stop critiquing and just ask how you can help. And I kind of peeled myself back and said, okay, I'm done. I'm done. I'm, I'm pivoting here. I've got nothing bad to say. I just want to know how I can help. How can I encourage someone today? Do you know when you leave this place today, there's a thousand people you'll face in the next few days that can be encouraged? I've never met anybody in my life who's above need for encouragement. Oh, they don't need to hear it, oh, they do. What about your spouse? What about your kids? What about your parents? What about your boss? Do you ever think about encouraging your boss? You're like, no. But do you realize that's what transformed people do? They, they start looking different than everybody else. What about encouraging your, your leadership here at the church? Oh, they don't need encouragement. Oh, they do. What about encouraging your, your group leaders and your, and your department heads, those you serve with and those who organize and plan everything out? Guys, we all need today a sense of lifting up. Let's be Barnabases. Because spirit-transformed people love to encourage people. What about Ananias and Sapphira? Well, real simple. Here's my thought from them today to give you a takeaway. Be sure you never cave in to the temptation of falsifying your partnership and building God's kingdom. It's not about what goes out. It's about what's held back. You ever heard of the story of a widow's might in the Bible? She gave very little, but she was praised. You know why? Because nothing was left. In the same setting, people that had plenty gave little because of what's, much was withheld. Here's my question. If we don't go all in, how are we going to know if God's all that? How will we know if he is truly a provider unless we trust him to provide for us? How will we know if he's truly the forgiver of our sins unless we come to him and we seek repentance? How will we know that he is able to heal us unless we ask for it? How will we ever know that he restores broken people unless we submit to his plan? If we don't go all in, how will we know if he is all that or not? And I promise you this, when you go all in with God, you will find that he is good, he is loving, and he is faithful. He will never leave you nor forsake you because he is a faithful God. I challenge you today, let's go all in. Hold nothing back. Lay it all before him today, every part of your life, because that's what spirit-transformed people do. Maybe today you're in the house, not living like you should live, and you know that. In a moment, I'm going to give you a chance to correct that today. I want you to come to your feet across the house this morning. Everybody, please stand quickly, reverently. If you're here today and you're not living like you should live, I want to give you a chance to fix that here this morning and go home different. In a moment, I'll count the three. Put your hand as high as you can. I'm going to pray with you right there in your seat. You might be thinking, Marty, I would never raise my hand in a place of strange people. Well, let me tell you, everybody here either has raised their hand or needs to raise their hand today. And those of us who put our hand up 
and said, Jesus, be Lord of my life, we're not looking down on you. We celebrate you. In fact, we've done everything today for this moment right now where you come back to the point of being reconciled to God. When I hit number three, just put your hand as high as you can. Don't be slow. Don't be shy. Don't be ashamed. God has great plans for your life, and let's begin together a journey of spirit transformation. Let's be people that give God everything, and that starts right here with salvation. When I hit three, put your hand as high as you can. Here we go. One, two, three. Hand up real fast. Just keep it high. Keep it high. High as you can. I want to see your hand. I got one, two, three, four, five. Keep your hand up high. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Keep your hand up high. 20. Anybody else on this side over here? Keep your hand up high. 21, 22, 23. Anybody else? 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Keep your hand up high. 31, 32. Anybody else today? 33. Anybody else today? You say, Marty, why are you counting? Here's what I'm counting because every number has a name. Every name has a story. Every story matters to God. And today, if your hand is raised, 30, where was I? 35, 36, roughly right there. I'm going to pray with you right now. If you did not put your hand up, you can still pray this prayer, by the way, because the prayer is what makes a difference. Are you ready to pray, church? Say yes. By the way, online, folks, this is for you, too. We're going to pray together on the, right now. Come on, say, Father God. Come on, say, Father God, I thank you for sending Jesus to be my Savior. Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me. I confess today that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And today I announce you as the risen Son of God, my Savior, and my Lord. In your name I pray, amen. Come on, big hand today for Saving Grace Church of the Move family. I love you guys. You guys are awesome. Been great being with you. Be blessed. I'm going this way. Thank you, Pastor Lee. Awesome. Hey, guys, let's give it up for Marty Sloan. What a message. Gosh. Marty, thank you. Give our love to Becky and Landon and Chandler. What a great message. I was convicted. I was convicted. God has done something amazing on the inside of me, and I want what happens on the outside of me to reflect that transformation fully. A lot of hands went up today. A lot of hands. You know, at the beginning of Marty's message, he said, a meeting with Jesus changes everything. And a bunch of you in the room, I, I saw some of you up in, up in the risers up there that maybe Marty didn't see. I saw you. Listen, all of you who raised your hand, 30, 40 of you, we got tables out here in the lobby that say next steps. Would you go out there? Would you stop by that table? They have a free gift for you. They want to chat with you. They don't want it to just be one act of raising a hand, but, but a walking out of life with Jesus that reflects on the outside of everything that we do. So don't miss that opportunity. Go by and visit with somebody there. Here's, here's the other thing about those tables. Those teams are also our prayer teams. So if you need prayer today, you got an interview coming up, you got a health issue going on, you got a family member that you're worried about, you can go by the next steps table. Those people want to agree with you in prayer. If you've got something going this week, go by and talk to them, okay? Thank you guys so much for being here today. Just a great morning to be in the house of God with the people of God. Thanks for being here. We always finish with a blessing out of Num Numbers, the sixth chapter. You can say this with us if you want. It's up here on the screen. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thanks so much for being here. We'll see you next time.